The current session is entitled something simple, the President political and military situation in the Middle East. As you all know, the Middle East remains the most unstable and violent region in the world. At the recent presidential debate in the United States, three of the six foreign policy topics that were discussed related to the Middle East. What I call the Arab snowmelt, as well as the threat of nuclear Iran, are two of the most important issues facing the world today. And I call it the Arab snowmelt because after a snowmelt, sometimes you get spring and summer, and other times you get an avalanche and a landslide. And I don't think it's quite clear which of those will result at this point. Our panelists will assess the present turbulent political and military conditions in Israel, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Iran, and Iraq, and their implications for war and peace in the near future. I can't imagine a more serious topic. We have two panelists this afternoon. I'll introduce Professor Kircher now. Professor Daniel Kircher is the Dan S. Daniel Abraham Professor of Middle East Policy Studies at Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public Policy and International Affairs. During a 29-year career in the U.S. Foreign Service, Ambassador Kircher served as U.S. Ambassador to Israel and as the U.S. Ambassador to Egypt. He is co-author of Negotiating Arab-Israeli Peace, American Leadership in the Middle East, and a forthcoming book, The Peace Puzzle, America's Quest for Arab-Israeli Peace. He serves as an advisor to the Iraq Study Group and currently serves on the Advisory Council of the American Bar Association's Middle East North Africa Rule of Law Initiative. As a member of the Board of Trustees of the American University in Cairo and as a member of the New Jersey Israel Commission, he received a BA from Yeshiva University and a PhD in Comparative Politics from Columbia. Please welcome Professor Daniel Kircher. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, in some respects, uh, this panel might have been uh, one of the first panels of the day in order to frame much of our discussion because we have been looking today at uh, critical ethical choices at uh, what might be called the uh, level of the national uh, military authority. And what I want to talk about are uh, dilemmas faced at the national leadership level, uh, particularly those uh, issues that uh, the United States faces in the Middle East today, uh, and I would divide that into uh, three uh, major areas. Uh, first of all, obviously, the changes that have been wrought as a result of uh, the Arab uprisings, the Arab awakening. Uh, I don't agree with the term, the Arab snowmelt, but we can talk about that. Uh, secondly, of course, uh, is the challenge of uh, Iran's uh, power uh, projection pretensions and the implications that has for security in the region. And the third is the unresolved uh, Palestinian-Israeli uh, uh, conflict. Uh, these occur against the backdrop of three uh, rather long-term trends in the Middle East, uh, all of which I think account in some part for the overall weakness of this region relative to uh, uh, in other international uh, arenas. First, we've seen uh, over a period of a couple of decades uh, the weakening and ultimately now the collapse of the Arab state system. And what that has given rise to, as we've talked about during the course of today, is the rise of non-state actors. Think about the following. Since the 1979 peace treaty between Israel and Egypt, Israel has engaged in a number of wars but not one of them has had an Arab state as a primary adversary. Arab states have become involved in the conflict, but each of Israel's wars since 1979 have primarily been between Israel and a non-state actor. Now this is a phenomenon, uh, the implications of which have uh, motivated many of the speakers today to talk about the need for thinking anew about the ethical requirements of military engagement, but at the national level, it also uh, requires a rethinking of how states operate in an environment in which uh, there is an asymmetry, not just in 
military engagement, but in the very nature of the competition. Uh, Israel operating now in an environment in which there still are Arab states, but weak enough Arab states that have given ground to non-state uh, actors. Uh, secondly, uh, the issues we talk about occur against the backdrop of uh, the weakness of the idea of Arabism, an idea that many of us uh, grew up studying, uh, promulgated by Gamal Abdel Nasser in the 50s, and uh, seemed to have seized the attention and support of many in the Arab world. And what's happened now in the last uh, 25 years or so is the rise of Islamism. The slogan might be from Nasser to Nasrallah. The idea that the defining ideology or the defining idea of many people in the Middle East is no longer a sense of pan-Arab, uh, uh, pan-Arabism, but rather an idea uh, based on religion. And this is nowhere clearer than in the immediate aftermath of the Arab uprisings, in which through democratic elections, uh, both in Egypt and Tunisia, uh, Islamist candidates have won fair and square. These have been free elections. They suggest a lot of reasons for this. There may be uh, factors other than Islamism, but the implication and outcome of what's happening is that we are going to be dealing with the idea of an Islamist trend for some period of time. This is quite different from what we faced in previous decades. And the third phenomenon, uh, which represents a kind of backdrop to the particular changes that we're going to talk about, is the weakness of the core in the Middle East and the reemergence of the periphery. The defining powers in the Middle East are not Arab. They are uh, Turkey, Iran, and Israel. And that has implications in terms of uh, relationships uh, both among those three as well as uh, between those three and uh, Arab states. Uh, it recalls, for example, an old strategy that Israel had uh, starting in the 1950s. It was called a strategy of, uh, of the periphery in which Israel believed that because it could not establish relations with its immediate neighbors, it had to reach beyond those neighbors to Turkey, Iran, and at that time Ethiopia, it may not be possible under current circumstances to reach out even to Turkey, but if those are the core powers that have a large role in defining what happens in the region, it uh, does have implications for the way a country like Israel or an outside power like the United States uh, conducts its affairs. Uh, these then, in a sense, these three phenomena represent the backdrop to the internal ferment in the uh, Arab world that gave rise to the Arab uh, upheavals uh, starting uh, about a year and three quarters ago, uh, and also, in a sense, uh, represent the backdrop to uh, the desire of Iran to project power. Uh, Iran has seen an opening for uh, its ambitions uh, to gain fruition. The United States has done Iran a great favor by weakening its two major rivals, uh, um, Afghanistan and uh, uh, Iraq. And therefore, uh, as part of a long-term effort to establish itself as a regional and ultimately as an international power, uh, the Iran issue has uh, risen to the fore. But it also suggests that the absence of a settlement of the Israeli-Palestinian issue uh, has to be included on this agenda. Uh, one can note, for example, um, more than 20 years ago, uh, the late Yitzhak, uh, Yitzhak Rabin, in a speech even before he became prime minister and then in his first meetings with President George H.W. Bush after he became prime minister, uh, Prime Minister Rabin uh, suggested that it was not only important for Israel to resolve the Arab-Israeli conflict, it was a national security imperative because as intrinsically as important as it was, it was far more important in his view to remove that issue from Israel's shoulders in order to confront what he saw as the emerging uh, threat of Iran over the horizon. This was in 1991 and 1992. Ten years later, King Abdullah, or then Crown Prince Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, in effect saw the same emerging power of Iran, the backdrop to what we now call 
the Arab Peace Initiative, first articulated and formulated at the summit in Beirut in 2002, had little to do with the Arab-Israeli conflict. It had mostly to do with the fact that the Saudis wanted the Arab-Israeli conflict off the agenda because they knew that the major threat to their position in the region was not Israel, but rather Iran. So we have the two uh, efforts by uh, regional leaders, Rabin and Abdullah, to kind of shake us up and shake us into a reality that we had to resolve this conflict. And here we are in 2012, and we are about as far away from the resolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict as perhaps we've ever been. This is one of the great ironies and paradoxes, because as recently as 2008, uh, Prime Minister Olmert and uh, President Mahmoud Abbas both in their own ways have admitted to getting as close as they ever were to reaching a solution. But uh, obviously for reasons associated with internal Israeli politics and uh, the weakness of Palestinian politics, they weren't able to uh, bring that uh, uh, impending agreement to fruition. So the combination of these three um, uh, major uh, trends, uh, the weakness of the Arab state system, the rise of Islamism, the importance of understanding the uh, centrality of the periphery, particularly Iran's power pretensions, as well as those of Turkey, combined with their implications now coming to fruition, uh, the Arab uprisings, uh, direction of which is certainly unclear, the, uh, the effort by Iran to achieve nuclear uh, weapons uh, capability, and the unresolved Arab-Israeli conflict make for a tremendous set of uh, challenges for policymakers all over. I would quote, uh, uh, at least in part, Professor Kasher, who uh, indicated earlier in his remarks how peace, uh, in his words, is better than war. Um, an obviously uh, uh, simple statement, but not a simplistic statement, because what it suggests is that policymakers face uh, the same kinds of choices, both policy choices and, in the end, ethical and moral choices of the kind that we've been talking about with respect to military leaders. In another conference uh, uh, sponsored by Beit Mar Shah, in fact, we examined the ethical choices that, that policymakers at the national level face, and they are, no, they are of no less moment than those faced on the battlefield, as we've heard throughout the day. Uh, whether it's uh, with regard to uh, the very nature of politics, as you know, politics is the competition over the allocation of scarce resources, and how societies make those choices uh, in a situation where there is poverty on the one side, but um, spending on the other side on issues of choice rather than necessity. In the American case, it may be on uh, related to tax policies. So we know this is now part of our national campaign. In the Israeli case, it has to do, of course, with settlement spending alongside the persistence of poverty in the country. These are choices that are of a basic ethical and moral character and reflect very much uh, the kinds of debates and the kinds of issues that we've seen today. So as we look around a very troubled region, um, it is uh, not only a place where uh, the Israeli army uh, and the American army, both fighting uh, very uh, challenging foes on the battlefield, have to confront these moral and ethical dilemmas, but where national policymakers must do the same. And how we confront those and the criteria and metrics by which we uh, assess those ethical choices, in a sense, will go a long way to determining whether or not, in fact, peace will be the answer or whether we'll be forced to continue to use the weapon of war as a, uh, a means of achieving our national, national policy. We know in the classical definition that war is supposed to be an extension of policy by other means. Too often our policymakers believe that it is the first uh, choice uh, rather than in a sense the last choice. Uh, and we only hope that uh, as they face these choices in the period ahead against the backdrop of these great challenges, uh, better choices can be made so as to achieve peace and therefore uh, the prosperity and uh, calm that we're all hoping and seeking. Thank you. So the second presentation 
uh, at this session is from Ambassador Idi Aironi, who is the Consul General of Israel in New York and has been a member of the Israel Foreign Service since 1991. That in itself is quite an accomplishment. During his tenure in Israel's diplomatic corps, Aironi has held positions in Los Angeles and New York. Prior to his arrival in New York, he served as policy advisor to the Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Jerusalem. In 1993, he was appointed by Israel's foreign minister to, the pol to be the policy assistant to Israel's chief negotiator with the Palestinians. So he's got a long history and perspective regarding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. He served in the Israel Defense Forces as a company commander in the infantry in the first Lebanon war, and he recently retired from military reserves with the rank of major. He is married to Julie Goodman Aharoni, a native of Los Angeles, they have three children, Talia, age 20, Sharon, age 17, and Adam, age 12. Welcome, Ambassador Aharoni. Thank you for uh, this nice introduction, uh, which is quite old. My oldest is already 23. Um, but thank you so much. This is a real honor for me, especially the fact that I was invited to share the panel with such an esteemed and legendary diplomat, former ambassador uh, to Israel, Dan Kurtzer. Uh, one of the uh, most inspiring moments in my career was when I was driving one day into the city. This is 2002, maybe 2003. On the radio, there was a radio show here on WABC called uh, Curtis and Kubi in the morning. And they had an item on um, an incident that took place in Israel the day before in which one of the members of the Knesset insulted Ambassador Kurtzer in a very big way. And they, um, it was a very uh, unfortunate incident, but what was unique and inspiring and uplifting about this whole thing is that in the middle of their conversation, Curtis and Kubi, about what happened in the Israeli Knesset, they said, oh, we have an interesting call coming in. It's Ambassador Kurtz's sister calling from New Jersey. And she called to defend her brother. And this was a very, very special uh, moment. And I'll never forget that. And I remember getting, back to, getting into my office that morning. And I, and I wrote a cable to Jerusalem about what happened with the ambassador's sister on the radio. And uh, so I'll never forget that. Also, I have to, uh, Alan, you mentioned the fact that I was involved in the team that negotiated. and I had a very, very small part uh, serving as uh, uh, Uri Savir's right-hand person at the time, but the person in the audience has really played a major part in those negotiations, sitting right there, and that's Professor Jacob Frankel, whom I met for the first time then in 1993 when he served as the governor of Israel's central bank and also led the economic negotiations uh, with the Palestinians. And today he's obviously the chairperson of J.P. Morgan Chase, and we'll hear from him later on. Also here I have to acknowledge the presence of my dear friend, Lieutenant General uh, Jerry Gershon, who was the head, what? Major General. Let me put it this way, the ultimate soldier, Jerry Gershon. Uh, a dear friend of mine, those of you who don't know, before he became uh, the head of uh, American Friends of the IDF, he headed the um, Israeli uh, Home Front Command and did it uh, exceedingly well and uh, successfully, and people still remember you with admiration in Israel. So thank you, Jerry. I was asked to um, say a few words about the situation. The ambassador already outlined um, the specific and unique implications of uh, what we're now seeing as the rise of political Islam, and I agree with you that we should not refer to it as the um, Arab Spring uh, for many reasons, but uh, what it really is is probably uh, the undoing, if you may, of the Sykes-Picot Agreement. This is not going to end tomorrow. This is a very, very complicated, unfortunately will not be violent, but more likely to be violent process that will last maybe even a generation. That's my belief. This is uh, the way we look at it. Uh, we don't know how this process will end, and we don't know what it means in terms of Israel's um, military and what it means in terms of the uh, policy, uh, but what 
we can do and what I'd like to do in the next couple of minutes is to share with you the things that we've learned thus far. And I'd like to begin with your permission since the Ambassador mentioned the lack of political progress between Israelis and Palestinians. I'd like to spend a couple of minutes talking about the way we see things, not necessarily from the point of view of the Israeli government, but more from the point of view of the Israeli society. Because we talk a lot about the will of politicians and we tend to forget sometimes that Israel is a democracy. It may be a hyperactive democracy, it can, it can be an overly energetic, dynamic democracy, some people say disturbed democracy, but at the end of the day, our democracy can be awkward, but the will of the public find its way to be expressed. It is being expressed almost every day also in policy making. What happened sociologically in Israel that affects directly the prospects of peace between Israelis and Palestinians? I'll tell you what I think. Something very dramatic happened 12 years ago that still impacts public discourse in Israel. We went to Camp David under the auspices of the U.S. administration. President Clinton put forth a far-reaching compromise that would have given the Palestinians the overwhelming majority of their territorial demands. The Palestinians said no. Israel said yes. But the Palestinians, not only that they said no, they waged war against Israel. Not necessarily against Israeli soldiers. They waged war against Israeli civilians. It was a strategic decision. Obviously, Israel's reaction to that, I don't have to tell you, started with a targeted campaign to eliminate the heads of the terrorist organizations, continued with the erection of the fence, and ended with the second dramatic event in that string of events that I'd like to uh, uh, describe to you here today, with the embrace of unilateralism as our policy vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians by Prime Minister Ariel Sharon in 2005, Ariel Sharon, the most unlikely person to do so, decided to uproot Israeli communities. Some of them were thriving communities from Gaza and to get out of Gaza. He fulfilled, if you may, the Palestinian dream. People tend to forget that in addition to all the communities that were destroyed in Gaza, five more communities in the Jenin area were also uprooted. What did the Palestinians do with that golden opportunity to turn Gaza into an oasis? They used Gaza as a launching pad to attack Israel time and again. And then the ambassador mentioned the third incident that happened in 2008. According to Condoleezza Rice's book, her memoirs, she was stunned by Ehud Olmert's proposal that was yet again declined by Abu Mazen. So you take all three events, major dramatic events that happened in the last 12 years, from the decline of the Camp David II attempt, the accord, the summit, through the aftermath of the disengagement from Gaza, all the way to the failure of the Olmert Abu Mazen talks. And here you have a new Israeli mindset that was formed throughout that decade that says the following, if up until Camp David we thought that the unfinished business between Israelis and Palestinians was the 1967 six-day war which was about land, meaning it gave, it gave rise to the whole notion of territorial compromise. You, we will give them territory. We will get in return peace and security. Then after those string of events that prove to the Israelis that maybe this is not about territory. Maybe it's, a, it's about something else. More and more Israelis became convinced that the unfinished business is not 67, but rather 48. And 48 was over our very right to exist. And if you're looking for an answer to the question why Israel is insisting on recognition, not only in our right to exist in peace and security, but also recognition in Israel as the national homeland for the, of the Jewish people, here's the answer. 
So sociologically, psychologically, you're looking at the majority of Israelis today that may support the two-state solution. By the way, the Israeli government is committed to the two-state solution, but at the same time will tell you, we don't believe it's about territory. Every study conducted on this issue points to that very fact. Israelis don't believe the conflict is about land. They used to. And you're looking at the divisions within the Israeli political system, at the makeup of the Israeli Knesset, and what I just told you is being reflected in the structure of the Knesset today. Simple. And people have to understand that Israeli democracy may be awkward, but at the end, it reflects the will of the people. Now, the Arab Spring, the so-called Arab Spring. We see a great deal of opportunity there, as well as a number of major risks. Where's the opportunity? And again, it affects directly the upcoming national elections in Israel, and I'll explain how in a second. For the first time in many, many years, maybe since 9-11, our, one of our biggest problems in uh, foreign policy, especially when it comes to the Middle East, not so much in the United States, but mostly in Europe, is the so-called linkage argument. What is the linkage argument? The linkage argument, by the way, has many fans in American academia. The linkage argument sim very simply says the following. The root cause for all instability in the Middle East is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. If you would like to bring about a resolution to all the problems in the Middle East, the first thing you have to do is resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. That will bring stability. That, that is really the meaning of the linkage argument. Who used the linkage argument? Mostly Arab leaders. Why? Your guess is good as mine, but probably in order to divert attention from their own wrongdoings. Because we know that at the end of the day, many of them did absolutely nothing to improve the lives of the, Pal of the Palestinian people. Now, the recent rave of unrest throughout the region is teaching all of, all of us a very important lesson. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is only one of many active conflicts that are national, military, tribal. They have nothing to do with Israel. I don't have to tell you that. The masses that were marching against their own regimes in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Libya, now in Syria, their plight has nothing to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Now that's a great opportunity for us because we can put things back into the right proportion. There is no reason why Israel shouldn't have diplomatic relations with countries that have no direct confrontation military confrontation or hostility with Israel. You know, for years we've been talking about Lebanon. Lebanon without the influence of Hezbollah, is there a reason we have no territorial claims over Lebanon? No claims that are related to water? We have no reason to be in conflict with the state of Lebanon, with Lebanon the country. Think about it. And I can go on and give you a whole list of countries in our region that theoretically speaking, in a new re-aligned Middle East, there's a great opportunity for Israel. The opportunity is also economic. We can do great business throughout the region. There is, for example, a fund that is being established in Israel these days that is de dedicated to investments in Turkey. I'm giving you this as an example because despite of the, all the talk about the tension between Israel and Turkey, I want you to know the trade between the two countries went up 30% in the last two years. 30%. So I'm just using this as an example to the kind of opportunity that exists there. The whole notion of democracy. Look, we are big believers in this thing called the theory of democratic peace. 
We believe that democracies do not invade one another, and no democracy was ever defeated by tyranny. Therefore, by definition, despite of the fact that we were somewhat quiet when uh, the so-called Arab Spring erupted, we sat quietly for about three weeks. Uh, we do support, obviously, every freedom movement in the Middle East and every pro-democracy force that exists throughout the hemisphere. But at the same time, we understand that democracy is way more than just the political process of elections. We remember what happened in Gaza. In Gaza, we indirectly enabled a terrorist organization, Hamas, to exploit the democratic process in order to take over Gaza. And today, Gaza, I don't have to tell you, is not being governed or managed democratically. So in the name of democracy, we allowed a terrorist organization to run the Gaza Strip. We have to understand the implications of this. Now obviously, as I said before, we support democracy. We believe that a more democratic Middle East, by definition, is a safer Middle East for the State of Israel. But at the same time, we say our job is to be alert, to monitor the situation very closely, and to make sure that we are prepared for all eventualities. Lastly, I'd like to touch upon the issue, obviously, of um, Iran. Um, you know, you all know that uh, Iran, the Iranian efforts to acquire nuclear capabilities, military capabilities, is an issue that tops our agenda. I just want to reiterate uh, to this audience our position on this issue. Uh, we do believe that uh, the world um, doesn't have the luxury of allowing Iran to become nuclear. And while we certainly had a big part in the fact that the entire international community is discussing the Iranian um, nuclear threat today, I would like to emphasize that Iran is certainly not just Israel's problem. This has to be put on the table. We believe that this is the wrong framing. I don't know if you guys remember, but about a year ago, the New York Times Sunday Magazine ran a story, a cover story, that said Israel versus Iran. And I know that some Hollywood writers were already working on a script, on a screenplay that will uh, uh, depict the showdown between Israel and Iran. This is not about Israel versus Iran. It's the wrong way to look at it. This is about the West versus Iran. Iran poses a conceptual threat, not only a physical threat. And this conceptual threat has to be dealt with because um, we believe, at the end of the day, they mean what they say, and they say what they mean. And I'd like to end with a little story that I heard from my great friend, Rabbi uh, Joe Potasnik, that illustrates that point. They say they tell the story about a meeting that supposedly took place some 90 years ago in Vienna between um, two Jewish, two Jewish uh, great minds. One was Rabbi Stephen S. Wise, the founder of Reform Judaism uh, here in North America, and the other was famous uh, psychoanalyst, uh, psych psychologist uh, Sigmund Freud. And according to the story, Sigmund Freud turned to Rabbi Wise and asked him, Rabbi, who would you say are the three greatest Jews alive? And the rabbi said, well, one would be you, Mr. Freud, obviously. The second, he said, would be Dr. Chaim Weizmann, the head of the Zionist movement at the time. And about a third, he said, I cannot think about a third. And Freud said, well, why won't you, rabbi, be the third greatest Jew alive? And the rabbi said, no, 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 absolutely not. Freud looked at him and said, rabbi, one no would have been enough. So people not, all, not always say what they mean, and they do not always mean what they say. But in the case of Ahmadinejad and his peers in the Iranian leadership, I think we don't need Sigmund Freud. We know exactly. They create enough trouble as is without becoming nuclear. They instigate instability all over the world, from Latin America through North Africa and Central Asia, certainly in the Middle East. Allowing them access to nuclear devices may change our lives in a very fundamental way.
Because I want you to think about not only about the fact, I know that Israeli government has been talking about Iran entering the zone of immunity and all that. That's clear, that's obvious, makes sense. I want you to think about what will happen to us, to the way we live our lives, to the way we conduct business, to the way we travel, once terrorist organizations and terrorist groups will have access to nuclear devices. Just as, to say, just as today Iran is allowing them access to conventional weapons. So on that optimistic note, I'd like to end my presentation and take some of your questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we probably have two or three minutes for one or two questions. We were talking about the whole day ethical concepts versus reality on the ground. And sometimes there's a, confl there's a conflict between what we discuss in the school rooms and the, you know, in the colleges versus what reality is. And I think that applies not just for moral issues, but I think it also applies policy makers. Policy makers have certain um, concepts which they keep on talking about, but when it comes to reality, it's not, it's not nothing to do with reality. So what I'm referring to specifically is that certain policy makers, they keep on using the same, con um, same slogans, that in order to achieve peace, there has to be land for peace, there has to be, the time is running out, demographic issues, peace is essential now for Israel. The only thing is, on the reality in the ground, it's not the case, because Gaza, for example, even if you do believe in these concepts, the reality of the situation is, that Gaza is firmly in control of Hamas. It's, it's, it's practically a state of its own. Abbas, even if he's supposedly in charge of the West Bank, supposedly he's in charge of the West Bank, but he's not firmly in control. So my, my question is this, by, by the, the danger of having these concepts when the reality is, when the reality is not there, first, we, we're not looking at other alternatives. Because if you keep on constantly saying the same concepts over and over again, when, there's no re when, it doesn't, when it has nothing to do with reality, then you're not looking at other alternatives. Maybe like, uh, you know, there should be alternatives like, you know, managing the problem instead of solving it now. And the second thing is that you keep on saying these, uh, when, you, when, the, when these policymakers keep on saying these same concepts over and over again, it gives an excuse, like, uh, like the ambassador said, for them not to do anything on the other side. If you offer other alternatives, right, it may not be perfect, but this may be the, um, this may be the way to go for the future. Great. Um, I'm going to uh, travel to Israel tomorrow with uh, my graduate students from Princeton. And the purpose of this trip is to do uh, research and interviews for a workshop that we're conducting on alternatives to the two-state solution. There are people thinking about alternatives to the two-state solution because in fact, the idea of promoting a two-state solution has been stalemated now for a number of years. Part of the reasons suggested by uh, Ido, uh, part of the reasons I think can also be found, and I'm not trying to market my book, but the book that's coming out, The Peace Puzzle, will have, I think, a great deal of additional information about the peace process over the past 20 years, more than what we think we know. I think some of the narrative that we think we know about the peace process, frankly, is wrong. So I, first of all, I think it's incorrect to say that nobody's thinking about alternatives. They're not just outside of government in a place like a university, but also inside government. The problem, however, in, in the, the formulating this question is twofold. Number one, uh, is there really an alternative to the partition of a land that both Palestinians and Israelis consider to be their own? Uh, for 75 years now, since the mid-1930s, people have been thinking about alternatives, including the status quo, or managing it, or deferring it, or interim solutions, and no one's come up with a better idea than finding a way that each side can achieve some degree of its national aspirations in some part of that territory. Now, if there is a better idea, let's talk about it. But so far, no one's come up with a better idea. Secondly, the actions that are taken on the ground, I, I made a, a brief reference to settlements. It, it, what prompted uh, the event in Israel where I was called a very bad name, which shouldn't be called to anybody, including, an, especially an ambassador, 
uh, was a speech that I gave in which I was talking about ethical choices facing national policymakers. And it occurred at a time when there was a <clears throat> major movement on the part of single mothers to avoid having the uh, Israeli budget for them cut. And they were marching over the, all over the country. And I was asked to address this question of ethical choices. And I said that it must be hard for national policymakers in this country, Israel, to face a situation where you have single mothers who are now seeing their allocations cut while substantial amounts of money are going to settlements. A policy of necessity on the one hand and a policy of choice on the other. And that prompted a settler who happened to be in the Knesset to call me the bad name and it led to my sisters defending me and all the rest. <laughs> the point is that actions taken on the ground while we're trying to figure out alternatives have an impact. And if we were not able to achieve a two-state solution 30 years ago, or 20 years ago, or 10 years ago, it's going to be harder every day that Israel continues its settlement activities. That's just a reality. You may like settlements, you may not like settlements, you may support it, you may not support it. The reality is that for Palestinians, this is eating up the very territory about which we're supposed to be negotiating. And they believe, not necessarily I, but they believe that they have made a historic compromise by negotiating over 22% of the land and are being now asked to accept the um, a further encroachment of that 22% in settlements. So on the one hand, yes, there are ideas that people are trying to think about. Number two, there aren't any better ideas that anybody's come up with. And number three, if we oppose unilateralism on the part of Palestinians, taking this issue to the UN or doing other kinds of unilateral activities, we ought to oppose unilateralism on the part of Israel as well. And settlements activity, I'm, I'm sorry to say, is a unilateral action by Israel that undermines the basis for any kind of a settlement of this crisis. On that note, I think we'll have to move on to the next session. Uh, we could spend all day talking about this issue, but uh, we'd very much like to get on to the presentation.